Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Discriminating Gamer. Say, if you haven't played blindfolded darts, then you don't know what you're missing. Ladies and gentlemen, today we're going to go ahead and take a look at Conquest and Consequence from GMT Games. We'll get back to the review in just a moment. I want to take a minute to ask you to check out my other channel, that is Cody Carlson PhD, where we talk about history, books on history, military history. I even post some of my uh, lectures for my classes on there. Please check that out. Please subscribe to that channel. And now, back to the review. In Conquest and Consequence from GMT Games, up to three players take on the roles of the various factions in World War II in the Asia-Pacific region. Specifically, uh, we're looking at the United States with their British allies, the Japanese, and the Russians. Now, this game is a sequel of sorts to Triumph and Tragedy, which is a game that came out, I think, in 2015, which was a very similar game, only was set in Europe. This game transports that system here to the Pacific, and uh, let's go ahead and take a look. Now this is a block war game, and players are going to go ahead and set up the various uh, blocks around the board, depending on what their setup chart says, and they're also going to look at their industrial tracks and various counters that they're going to place along the board. Now, the game takes place between 1936 and 1945. You're going to advance the year marker, the first of every year, not on the first turn, and then you're going to shuffle the, the card decks in the game. You're also going to roll for initiative to see who goes first that round, and critically, too, you're also going to be paid peace dividends. For every year that you're at peace, you can draw a uh, little counter, and it may say zero, or it may have a greater number on it. And that's uh, part of your victory points for maintaining peace. Now, next, you have the player production phase. Now, both the United States and Russia will not only be doing production for themselves, but also for their respective uh, proxies in China. But how it works to, to do production for the, for the big powers here is you have three... Uh, blocks. You have industry, you have resources, and you have population. Now, prior to being at war, really the only two that matter are uh, industry and population. So you're going to go ahead, and whichever is the lowest of those, that's the number of points you get to spend on uh, production. After you go to war, you add resources in there, and whatever is the lowest of those three, then, is what you use to determine your uh, production. Once you have production, you can go ahead and you can use that to either purchase cards and more on cards later, or you can use it to um, place new blocks on the board in areas you control. Now also too, because this is a block war game, you've got the pips at the tops of the blocks, which means you can spend production not just on placing them on there, and when you place a block on the board, it comes in at a number one, but any unit on the board, you can rotate to its full strength, but you can only do that once per block per uh, production round. Now after production, you go into the government phase, and this is where card play is gonna come in. Essentially, you're going to take turns playing cards. Now, your cards uh, do different things. You have action cards and you have investment cards. Now, with action cards, initially what you're trying to do here in this phase is diplomacy. You're trying to influence different countries around the board. Now, you've got cards that on either side are going to say a specific country or region. And what you can do is you can play that card out in front of you saying, I'm influencing you know, this region, this specific region. Well... If at the end of the uh, that round, if no one else has, has, has you know stopped you, you can go ahead and place one of your influence there. And gradually, you gain more influence. You gain up to three, and that means eventually you're going to gain the, the population, the resources to add to your own tracks uh, if you gain enough influence there. 
But if during that round someone else plays a card that matches your card, say Vietnam, then both those cards are immediately discarded, nobody gets it. So you're trying to play those cards in order to gain more influence around the board. Now, the next kind of card is the investment card. Now, the investment cards do different things. For instance, in the center, usually they will say factory in a number. Now, if you play enough of those cards um, on, on your turn that equal or exceed the amount of industry that you already have, you can move your industry up one level. So that goes ahead and increases your, your industry. But you can also play them for their technology. Now, there's different kinds of technology that each of the side that is on each of the sides of the cards. You can go ahead and if you can match two of those, if you can play two of those cards at the same time that, that, that has the same technology, then you can go ahead, discard one of those cards, keep one of the cards in front of you to remind you you have that technology for the rest of the game. And the various technologies will do all sorts of things. They'll give you the ability to have, you know, better weapons, better naval, air, or, or, or land power. But also, too, there's espionage. You can conduct various espionage uh, against the enemies with those cards. And then critically, too, you can also try to gain the atomic bomb. Now, you have to gain it in sequence, meaning you have to play two atomic number ones, then two atomic number twos, and two atomic number threes, etc., until you get to two uh, atomic number fours. And if you can get all four of those in sequence, you automatically win the game. I think you have to have a plane in range of your enemy, but, but essentially, you win the game. Now, once everybody has passed, you can go ahead then and figure out who gets diplomacy where on the board, and then also, too, you discard down to your allowed hand size. Now, next you have seasons, and this is kind of where you can engage in military actions. Now, each of your action cards that have the countries on it for diplomacy, they also have uh, something that says spring, summer, uh, or fall, and they have a number and a letter uh, in front of them. Now, when you play these cards, essentially, you all play at the same time. Uh, during spring round, and whosoever, whichever number come, or whichever letter comes first alphabetically, they get to go first. And then the number is the number of units on the board that you can move and engage in, in, in combat with. Now, if every units of different factions go into the same space, then you go ahead and you have to resolve combat. So essentially, you're going to put all of your blocks face down in front of you so you can all see uh, what the, the, the numbers of them are. And then you, the attacker, uh, well, depending on depending on circumstances, the attacker or the defender is going to going to go ahead and roll. And as you roll, you're going to, of course, move down your your pips, and you're going to try to eliminate as many of your enemies as you can before they get an option to to come back. Now, this is where some of the technology is important because the technology may allow uh, you know one side or the other to, to to fire first, which is absolutely critical in this game. Now, after the three seasons play out, and you get to uh, winter. Some players can, can, can do some things, can man manipulate the, the, the winter turn, uh, but after that you're going back to the new year and starting all over again. Now throughout this cycle, there's going to be some special rules, like Russia or, or the United States can be reinforced at certain times. Um, the Japanese will have the opportunity to make a sneak attack at one point. So there's all sorts of different kind of little things that go on throughout that bit. But critically, you're trying to gain uh, major cities, major population areas, and that's going to go ahead and give you uh, essentially more victory points. Now, at the end of the game, whoever has the highest number of points wins! Conquest and Consequence. So I played Triumph and Tragedy years ago, and I loved it. And I really liked it. I played it a few times, and then I just it just never got to the table again. And I ended up giving it away to a friend, and I kind of re regretted that for a while. I was really looking forward to this when I heard they were printing it. But it's the same thing. I, I, I had a hard time finding people to play Triumph and Tragedy with, and when I got this, I had a hard time playing finding people to play this with. In fact, I got this probably a year ago, GMT sent this to me, and I, I just got it to the table fairly recently. So, but I finally did. I was really excited. So we sat down and we started playing the game, and so much of it was just coming right back to me uh, about how you, you, you know the, the game is played. And I love the diplomacy aspect of this game. I love chasing those countries and other people making decisions. Well, do I want to play this card to, to negate that diplomatic attempt, or or do I need the command card for 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 the military offenses? Um, so I, I but I really like the diplomacy in the game, and I really liked how that plays out quite a bit. Also, too, I like the technology. I like I like the whole investment card thing with where you're trying to, to, to chase the technologies you want. And some of them are pretty powerful. Some of them not so much, but some of them are really, really quite good. And the game we were playing, there was me, Aaron, and Zach, and Aaron was just a demon with the tech. He was trying to get tech because he was trying to chase the atomic bomb, 
which is not easy. It's not an easy thing to do to get the atomic bomb, but he was chasing that. So consequently, when we went to war, he had a ton of tech. And it was funny because he ends up fighting both... Because So Russia attacked me. They attacked Britain and India. Uh, and I had to divert production toward that in order, instead of to, toward Hawaii and the West Coast. And eventually, of course, Aaron goes to war with me. He's in the United States. He's Japan. He goes to war with me in the United States. And then he's fighting, and then, then Zach betrays him and goes after him. And all his tech was aimed, was naval tech largely, and it was aimed against the United States, and it wasn't helping him in Asia. And Zach was able eventually to to win the game as Russia because he, he was able to, he packed both me and, and, and Aaron. But it was a great game, and it's a great story. And I like the game because it's involved, but it's not it's not overly complicated. It's not overly complex. It's a good, it's as much a diplomatic game as it is a war game, which is one of the reasons why I like it so much. And I like all these aspects to it. Um, my only negative is the, the, the combat system with the blocks is just a little bit counterintuitive the way it's it's written. It took me, took me a, a minute to kind of try to figure that out, and... and it was just is not as intuitive as I would have liked. It's not bad. Um, it just once you figure it out, you figure it out. But it just I I, I kept kind of going back in my head to like Columbia games and how they do um, block war games and stuff. And I just I wish there was a little hair more streamlined here. Again, not that it's bad. Just just kind of my own preference. But I think I think the the map's good looking. It's a mounted map. It's good looking. I like that each player has um, player aids, their own individual player aids, which are really nice. Uh, it's just, it's a great package. If you're looking for a good World War II game, and what's cool is it's a three-player game. It shines at three players, and there's not enough good three-player games. Um, then this one, I think you're really going to love. If you play Triumph and Tragedy, you know how to play this one. Recommendation for the Discriminating Gamer for Conquest and Consequences. Buy it. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you once again for joining us today on The Discriminating Gamer. As always, we ask you to please leave a comment for us on YouTube, on Board Game Geek, on our Facebook page, or on thediscriminatinggamer.com. We ask you to please like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and follow us on Twitter. I'd also ask you, ladies and gentlemen, to please check out my other channel, that is Cody Carlson PhD, where we talk about military history, books on history, fun things like that. I'd ask you to go ahead and please subscribe to that channel. That would mean a lot to me. And I'd ask you also, ladies and gentlemen, to please leave a thumb to a like, for this video here on YouTube and on Board Game Geek, that also helps us out a lot as well. And if you are a big fan of the channel, if you like the content that we put out here, I'd humbly ask you to click on the Super Thanks button here on this channel, or on this uh, YouTube page, uh, and leave a contribution. That helps us out tremendously. Thank you very much. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, you know, speaking of dartboards, I recently bought a dartboard and I put it on the ceiling. It made me throw up. You know, there is nothing more important than the people. Ah! Sean! Why? You knew what I was when you asked me to review board games with you. Do you want to go review a board game right now? Yeah. Yeah, let's do it again. Okay.